today to uh, talk to you about my passion in oral surgery and implantology, which is the use of 3D imaging and computer-guided implant surgery to improve the accuracy and the success of tooth replacement. Uh, I was trained the way that uh, most of us were trained about 20 years ago uh, in residency, and um, I used for imaging a panoramic radiograph. And we had a little 25% magnification ruler that we used, and that's what we used in order to measure how much height of bone we had in order to determine what length of implant we we're going to place. And then, of course, we determine the width of the implant essentially by the size of the tooth, a wide platform generally for a molar, a, a narrow diameter for a, a, a usually a lower incisor or an upper lateral incisor, and then somewhere in the middle uh, for premolar teeth and canines. Um, and then we might get study models to uh, take a look at the patient's occlusion and decide where the implants were going to go. And if we decide to get really fancy, we might even get some study models and have the patient's restorative dentist do a wax up that we would use to indicate to us where the uh, proposed uh, final restoration was going to be so that we could place our implants a little more accurately. And sometimes we actually use that surgical guide uh, in, in surgery. Um, you know, those techniques uh, served us well, or served me well in my earlier years of practice. And here's a patient who came to see me. She was about a 75-year-old woman who had uh, fallen at home and fractured teeth numbers eight and nine, as you can see here. And they're basically uh, not restorable. And so the plan is to remove both of these teeth and at the same time place immediate implants. And so we had a surgical guide made. We got study models, had a surgical guide made from wax ups where we have the channels through the pontics uh, indicating uh, the path of the uh, long axis of the implant coming out in the cingulum area for the central incisors. And you can see on uh, the right here that our post-op film, or actually this is our second stage film, uh, when we place the provisional abutments is that uh, the implants are nice and parallel, uh, they're nicely spaced, um, and uh, that this you know, is a nice uh, aesthetic and functional uh, uh, result. And then we take a look at uh, our second stage where we're placing our uh, final abutments and provisional crowns, which we're going to uh, give some time for the soft tissue to, to uh, contour around these before the final restorations are made. And we've got some nice uh, uh, positioning, nice aesthetics, good uh, tissue margins, everything looks nice and healthy. And we would call this a nice result of uh, placing immediate implants and uh, uh, now the final restoration, which was about to occur. And unfortunately, I didn't get final, final photos on this patient, but uh, she did have a, a very nice result according to the, the GP. Another case here, we have a patient who comes to see me and he's got uh, quite a, a few uh, implant related and periodontal issues. Uh, we're going to be removing tooth number two, as you can see here, and then tooth number three needs to be replaced with an implant. Uh, teeth numbers seven, eight, and nine are all periodontally failing and need to be removed and replaced with implants. And tooth number 10 has been missing for a couple of years and patient would like to remove or to replace that uh, so that he can have an implant supported bridge up front or actually individual uh, fixed uh, anchored uh, prostheses if, if possible. Also, he wants, uh, we want to restore this down to the second molar on both sides. So we have implants planned at the number 18 and the number 31 sites. Well, as you can see here, this patient has a deep overbite. And we know that we're not going to restore, his dentist is not going to restore him in that overbite. He's going to level out the occlusal plane. So I asked the dentist, please send me some surgical guides, do a wax up and let me know where those, uh, especially those anterior maxillary teeth are going to be post-operatively, I'm sorry, post-restoratively, um, uh, so I can place the implants in the right sites and in the right positions for him. So he said, gladly, I'll get the patient in, I'll do some wax ups, I'll make some surgical guides, sent the patient uh, for surgery, patient shows up for surgery, I open the boxes, and this is what I found, just some vacuform shells of the patient's 
existing occlusion, which essentially were worthless for what I needed. So I did this case pretty much uh, by eyeballing the whole thing. And yeah, you know, I think uh, all things considered, uh, this is a pretty nice, uh, pretty nice result. It looks like all the implants are are well positioned. This number 31 implants a little close to number 30, but luckily the tooth had already had a root canal. And uh, it's now been about uh, 10 years since I did this case and still no issues in this area. And uh, clinically, I would say this is a nice result. And these were all individual crowns that were placed and um, uh, were restored, restored back to the first molar up above and then the second molars down below. And I would call this a really nice clinical result. And so, it's not that we can't um, place implants uh, well by the traditional techniques. It's just that you know I've learned over the years um, that there are some issues with the way that we traditionally have done implant surgery. And that is that I've learned the clinical exam and then using study models and panoramic radiographs uh, and periapicals can all be misleading of the patient's true clinical anatomy. How many times have you had a surgical guide available from a study model and you had the implant placement, the positioning all set uh, through the center of the occlusal table of, of the pontic in the wax up or in the study in the surgical guide and you flap it open and you, you realize that you can't place the implant in that position and so you need to move the implant generally a little bit more uh, lingually or palatally in order to get the implant in good solid bone. The other thing is that two-dimensional imaging by itself can be very deceiving and this is a good example of how two-dimensional imaging non-radiographic um, shows us this point. So here's three guys at the museum. They look like they're probably friends. They, they kind of look like they kind of went together. They're all wearing coats. They must have all come in from, from the cold together to look at some dinosaur bones. And here, if we look at this two-dimensional image, we would think that uh, the guy in the red jacket is being uh, eaten by this uh, by this T-Rex or what, you know, whatever this is. And of course we know that this isn't true, that this is just a kind of an optical illusion because we've got a two-dimensional uh, image of a three-dimensional situation. And so uh, unfortunately, if we were using this same type of information to determine, let's say, if there's some pathology or if this guy was really in trouble, um, we would be deceived. Same thing goes for using two-dimensional imaging for planning implants. So this is a, a patient who uh, I uh, saw actually right before I started doing uh, CT imaging and guided implant surgery, before I had cone beam in my office. And as you can see here, I took out tooth number 31. I did ridge preservation grafting. And now the site's ready to have the implant place. Um, I, uh, I took a wax pencil and I marked out basically the dimensions of the crown that was going to go there, the dimensions of the implant, and the location of the mandibular nerve. And it looks like uh, if you measure this with your 25% magnification ruler, that there's plenty of room for at least a 13 millimeter implant. And so, um, you know, I then got cone beam in my office and decided before I actually did the surgery that I was going to use 3D imaging uh, for treatment planning this case. And um, sure enough, I'm glad that I did because if you look at the cross-sectional uh, cross image, you would see that even though it looks like from here to here is 15 millimeters, so from here to about here is at least 16 and a half millimeters that an, a 13 millimeter implant should be fine and be away from the nerve. If I placed a 13 millimeter implant, we would have had this situation here on the right where the implant would have perforated through the lingual, lingual cortex of the mandible. And when that occurs, you know, if we're lucky, um, then the implant just sticks out through the lingual cortex and maybe the patient will kind of play with it with their tongue for a while until they irritate the overlying mucosa, the mucosa breaks down, the implant gets infected, you take the implant out, you graft, and you start over again and you put a shorter implant. That's if you're lucky. But if you're not lucky, uh, you could hit the lingual nerve that passes in this fossa and the patient could end up with a temporary or even a potentially a permanent paresthesia or anesthesia of the tongue. If you're really not lucky, 
you know, you can perforate the lingual artery, which also passes in this area. And of course, then you've got a major hemorrhage into the floor of the mouth. And there have been you know, reported deaths occurring from airway obstruction when this has occurred in the dental office. And of course, we all want to avoid these kind of complications. And so, uh, you know, this is one of the pitfalls of two-dimensional imaging and planning implants, especially in this area of the mouth. But really anywhere is that 2D does not just doesn't give you a full picture. Um, the issues with traditional implant planning is that many times we would look on our two-dimensional images. We might have a surgical guide made that told us right where the center of the uh, final prosthesis was going to be the occlusal table, and we had our pilot drill through the uh, through the pontic in the surgical guide. And when we flapped it open, we would see that the bone was not where we thought it was. It was a little bit more to the lingual or the palatal. And so we'd have to move our implant clinically in, in surgery uh, to try to uh, get this implant in good solid bone. And then uh, the result was the, the restoration uh, became an afterthought. And you know, you talk to enough general dentists, restorative dentists, um, they commonly complain about seeing uh, implants that were placed a little bit too far lingually or a little bit too far buccally where they're really having a hard time restoring them. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to provide our, uh, our referring dentist and our restorative dentist that we work with implants placed in the right place every time. So using a panoramic radiograph and model-based surgery is not always a guarantee of success. Just ask these patients and these dentists. We take a look at these images, and for, these are fortunately not my cases, but you can see that these are all cases where a surgical guide may have been used, uh, two-dimensional imaging was definitely used, and implants were placed by some experienced surgeons all of which are basically not restorable. I mean, these are not, this implant here is going to be, have to be taken out. You can see this one's probably a little bit too far to the facial. Uh, this implant's going to be a little difficult to restore. This one's going to be impossible. Uh, here we see clinically, we'll probably, uh, the dentist will probably end up just burying this implant and not even using it and just have uh, a restoration on these three implants here or maybe use this one. Uh, probably, probably most likely use that one. But, um, you know, again, this is a situation we'd like to avoid. This is another case, not done by me, but the patient had implants placed by flapless surgery using a surgical guide made off of a study model. And you can see that pretty much every one of these implants is placed too far to the facial because the two-dimensional panoramic didn't tell us the three-dimensional width of the bone clinical exam was deceiving, and the surgical guide just messed us up. Now here's a case where I used a surgical guide. I had this patient come in and uh, we took out tooth number 31. Again, this, is, this was pre-cone uh, beam in my office, and so I wanted to make sure that the implant was properly placed because I knew that the distal root of number 30 uh, went kind of distally, and so I made this uh, surgical guide with a metal sleeve, guide sleeve, to make sure that my pilot drill was in just the right place at the right angulation, the right positioning, and all subsequent drills would follow in that path. And so uh, I wouldn't have to worry about uh, coming close to tooth number 30. Well, <laughs> here's my post-op film. And, and even though I was as careful as I could be, and I'd had probably you know at least 10 years of experience under my belt when I did this case, Tooth number 30 has been impaled by my implant of tooth number 31. I ended up having to take the implant out, um, do apical surgery on the first molar, and uh, eventually grafted the site and then placed another implant a little bit more distally. Um, and in that case, uh, we actually uh, used 3D imaging to make sure that, and a, guided sur a surgical guide. Um, to make sure that the implant was properly placed. Another case, 49-year-old man came to, comes to my office and uh, he's basically healthy, uh, but he's got periodontal involvement of teeth numbers 12, 13, and 14. And so uh, we look at his uh, panoramic that we took in, in uh, 
at the initial exam. And you can see the 12, 13, and 14 all need to go. And I told them we're going to need to build this bone up. Uh, we're going to have to do some grafting. Uh, we're going to uh, have to do sinus lift in order to place implants. And the patient, what he really wanted was to be able to have three individual implants so that he could floss between them like they were his own teeth. He didn't want to have a bridge. And um, so I told him that, you know, with the grafting and, and uh, sinus lift, we'd be able to accomplish that. And I guess between my fees and his restorative dentist fees, he decided to go somewhere else. And so we never saw him for surgery. Well, he shows up in the office about, eh, probably about six months ago. And, um, you know, he's got now a prosthesis in place. And it's, uh, you can see that it's a, a three unit bridge on two implants and looks aesthetic, it looks good, the soft tissue looks healthy. And I asked, why have you come to see me? And he said, I'm, I'm not happy. He said, I, you promised me that I would have three implants and I'd have three individual teeth. And um, I had, went to a board certified oral surgeon and a board certified prosthodontist. They did a CAT scan. The prosthodontist made a surgical guide for the oral surgeon. And um, I went to surgery and when I woke up, the surgeon told me there was only room for two implants. He placed the first two and there wasn't room for the third one. And I said, well, gosh, um, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Let's get some radiographs. So we got a cone beam scan and uh, looked at everything in 3D. And really, I mean, I would say, you know, it's not the greatest result on the sinus lift, but the implant placement looks good. Um, you know, the angulation looks pretty good. I would say that this is a nice case. You know, the surgery was well done. I know the surgeon, I know the prosthodontist, they both do good work. Um, but this patient was extremely unhappy because he had been told that he was going to get, not only by myself, but by the surgeon who actually did the surgery, three individual implants and three individual crowns. And he was complaining of constantly having food trapped in this area and hygiene issues, and he was fed up with it. He pulls out of his pocket this you know, photocopy of a radiograph saying, look, there's room for one, two, three implants in here. And I said, well, you know, you might be right. So we did some planning on, uh, on cone beam. And sure enough, with adequate spacing, these implants are about three millimeters apart, three millimeters from the adjacent teeth. Um, we actually can get three implants uh, in place and um, they can be restored with individual, individual crowns. Now, the patient really wants me to take out those two implants, bone graft and start over. I don't really want to do that, but um, it just goes to show that even with a good, good clinical team, experienced prosthodontist, experienced surgeon with 3D imaging and a model-based surgical guide, that implant placement um, can be less than accurate. And, and as you can see, the surgeon probably was going to place the first implant here, but it went off at an angle. He placed the second implant through his surgical guide. It also went parallel to the first at an angle. And of course, there was no room for the, for the third. And um, so, you know, this is the kind of thing that I would see and we would experience with traditional uh, implant surgery. So, you know, it makes you think, let's go back to why we place implants. You know, the bottom line is we place implants to replace missing teeth. And of course, teeth are, I always tell patients in consultation, you've basically got a crown, which is the part that you see in the mouth, and you've got the root, which is what anchors the crown into the bone. And an implant is essentially the same thing. You've got a prosthetic crown, the implant is your prosthetic root, and of course you've got the abutment uh, between the two. And so, you know, when we are placing implants, we have to be aware of where we're putting them and how accurately we're placing them. How good are we at our implant surgery when we use model-based surgical guides and or uh, placing them freehand? Well, 
overall about 10 to 15 percent of the implants that are placed and these statistics come from talking to a number of of well-known surgeons and looking at the literature about 10 to 15 percent of the time the implant is not exactly where we had intended it to be it may be off so little that it's still restorable or it may be way off where it's not restorable at all. But overall, about 10 to 15% of the time, the implants are not where they were planned to be. And in the anterior aesthetic zone, which is even more critical uh, where we place the implants, uh, it's a little higher, about 20%. And, um, you know, as good as we are, we need to do better. We need to get rid of this concept of surgically driven implant placement where the surgeon flaps it open and puts the implant where the bone is and replace it with the concept of prosthetically driven implant placement. And of course, what we mean by that is that we start with the ideal prosthetic restoration. We start with our blueprint, as you can see here, and we work backwards from there to place the implant in the ideal site. And if the bone is not ideal, if there's not enough bone, if the soft tissue is not ideal, then we prepare the site with bone grafting, with soft tissue grafting to get them ready for ideal implant placement before we place that implant. Guided implant surgery takes 3D imaging one step further, uh, where not only are we using 3D imaging to accurately evaluate the bony anatomy, but we're actually doing the treatment planning on the computer in 3D virtual reality, and then using that surgical data uh, and uploading it to a site somewhere where a surgical guide, a very accurate surgical guide, is made from that three-dimensional data. So this is basically how it works. This is uh, uh, the system I have in, in my office is the uh, Serona Galileo. So I also have CEREC, uh, CAD CAM system. And what I'm able to do is I'm able to import my uh, 3D optical scan of the patient's occlusion into uh, my cone beam scan. And then also my proposed restoration uh, this is actually a digital Pontic that was uh, made on CEREC and import all this data into the scan for the purposes of implant planning. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to select my implant system that I'm going to use. It's going to be at site number eight. I'm going to use a BioHorizons. Um, I'm going to use the tapered internal plus laser lock, uh, 4.6 millimeter diameter, 12 millimeter length, click OK. And then I drag and drop my implant into the site. And then uh, with my mouse, I can adjust the position, the angulation, the depth, and the positioning of that implant so that it's lined up correctly and accurately with my final restoration. If it's going to be a crown or that's going to be cement retained, then generally we put the long axis of the implant along the incisal edge. If it's going to be a screw retained, then it's a little bit more lingual into the cingulum area of the tooth. And we can look at this in three dimensions. We can rotate our 3D skull around, uh, scroll through it, um, and uh, even see, make, uh, we can uh, put in our uh, guide sleeve to make sure that there's enough room for the guide sleeve interproximally. So we're gonna select our BioHorizons guided surgery uh, system in this case. Click OK, and now you can see this is our guide sleeve, and we can make sure that there's enough room. Use that for fine-tuning our implant placement. And then uh, we can print out a, uh, a planning report that we can look at, um, which will show us uh, multiple slices of the uh, implant placement uh, on, on screen. Uh, we can print this out. We can place it in the patient's chart. We can also uh, PDF this and send it to the patient's dentist and make sure they're happy with the uh, where the implant is going to be placed. And then the next step for ordering, ordering the surgical guide is very straightforward. We just go to a, uh, another drop-down box, uh, order the surgical guide, and we go through a number of steps. Here we're going to use our registered optical impression uh, in order to um, create the surgical guide. Um, and then we're going to let the, let the uh, uh, guide manufacturers know which implant system, which guided implant system we're going to use. And click OK, next, next a few times. We have all our information there. 
which uh, we then can prepare the data for transfer either on a CD or direct uploading and makes the process very simple. It only really takes a couple minutes to create our uh, surgical guide. And it's that the guide sleeve in the surgical guide that really does uh, the lion's share of the work. It, it basically directs the, the direction, the position, the angulation, and the depth of the implant placement. And then of course, then we, uh, once we've done all this, then we can upload our um, order, print out um, a report that will go into the patient's chart, again, saying our implant size and the, the surgical guide's been ordered. And um, then that goes off to uh, the lab and we get our surgical guide back. And the surgical guides that are used for guided implant surgery can be made a number of different ways. They can either be by milling from a, from a solid block of acrylic or they can be created de novo from a 3D printing process. Um, but all the information uh, comes from that 3D imaging, the combination of the CAD CAM data and the cone beam data. And uh, as I mentioned, the essential part of this whole uh, process is that master sleeve because that is what controls the position, the angulation, and the depth of each osteotomy. And when we're using a fully guided system as opposed to a partially guided system, it also controls the placement of that implant fixture. So here is what our surgical guide looks like. And you can see here um, the guide sleeve within that surgical guide. Uh, here it is on the surgical model. We can actually use this in order to some, uh, create a, a provisional prosthesis if we wanted to, too. So here is now our post-op uh, image that was used um, or that was taken on that patient after implant placement. And you can see here that the implant placement was just spot on perfect. And we're right in the middle of the uh, of the ridge buccal lingually, right where we need to be. Uh, this patient has an immediate provisional restoration, uh, which you can see here. And uh, the final abutment is act was actually placed at surgery. And uh, we're in good solid bone parallel to the adjacent teeth. So this is ideal implant placement that was done very simply. The procedure I think, took about three minutes to place the implant. Uh, through a tissue punch technique because uh, there's lots of keratinized tissue. And then uh, the, uh, the provisional restoration, which was pre-made, um, went on with almost no adjustment. My first guided implant surgery, though, was not quite so simple. Uh, this patient came to me uh, with just a, basically a, a terminal dentition. Uh, I edentulated her, and um, um, she wanted to have a fixed prosthesis in the upper and lower arches and had heard from her dentist about guided implant surgery. And I'd been thinking about taking a course in guided implant surgery. This was back in 2006 um, because I saw the technology as being the way of the future. And the um, patient, patient basically told me if I didn't take that course and do her surgery guided, um, she was going to go somewhere else. And so I uh, basically looked for the first course that I could find, hopped on a plane, went away for the weekend and came back and did my very first guided surgery case. It was a, a Nobel uh, teeth in an hour, upper and lower case. Took me a little bit longer than an hour, but we did eight implants on the maxilla, eight implants on the mandible, placed an immediate prosthesis on each. And um, the surgery took, including prosthesis placement, a little over two and a half hours. And this was, um, a revelation that I, mean, I could place 16 implants that accurately in two and a half hours and have this type of accuracy. And this patient is now, uh, what, eight years post-op and I see her on a regular basis and all these implants are still doing quite well. So guided implant surgery really allows us to provide our patients with the best treatment plan that we possibly can because we're placing our implants accurately, precisely, and more importantly, consistently. That guide makes sure the implants go where they need to be every time, or let's say 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, also, we're doing our treatment planning completely prosthetically driven. So we're not flapping the side open and placing the implant where the bone is. We're planning the prosthesis first and placing the implant where it needs to be for those final prostheses. And 
because the implants are placed more ideally in the bone at better angles, easier to restore, easier to maintain for the patient, uh, hygiene's improve. We have really a higher success rate with guided implant surgery than we do uh, with freehand implant placement. Also, the, te the technology allows us to place implants immediately um, and place provisionals immediately because we can see at consultation whether we're going to have enough bony anchorage for primary stability when we place the implant or not. Um, and whether or not there's enough stability or we think there's gonna be enough stability to place an immediate provisional. So here is a patient that comes to my office. Um, he has got tooth number eight here, as you can see, has a fistula, it's got bone loss, um, it's got a periapical radiolucency, periapical lesion, it's had endo, it's had apical surgery, and this tooth is basically failing. Um, there's lots of healthy apical bone to engage. And so we're gonna treatment plan this case with guided implant surgery. And we're going to use the planning software to uh, decide where the implant needs to be placed for the final prosthesis and whether or not we can place an immediate, uh, immediate provisional. And as you can see here, with a, a 15 millimeter implant at this site, um, and I'm not sure why this says 11, but anyway, um, we've got a 15 millimeter implant in good solid bone, at least half of the implants in solid bone, if not more. So we know that this is a case where we can do an immediate prosthesis. It's gonna have enough anchorage that we're gonna be able to, uh, to be successful. And I always tell my patients that when we're doing an immediate prosthesis, that the tooth is a party tooth. It's there only for looks, it's not there for function. And if there's any doubt in their mind that they can stay on a softer diet and stay away from that tooth for at least six weeks, they get a flipper or an Essex bridge. Um, also, um, we always make a, an Essex bridge as a backup to have that surgery just in case um, I place the implant and it feels not quite as solid as I would like it to be. We've always got that backup uh, ready to go. And so the patient doesn't have to leave missing their front tooth. Um, using our surgical guide with the, uh, with the sleeve in it, the master sleeve, we can use components from the implant manufacturer to actually set an analog into our master model and create a master model with an analog. And this is what's used to create the, the immediate provisional restoration that is placed at surgery that requires essentially no adjustment. And so here we are removing tooth number eight in this patient. You can see that there is a, a periapical uh, granuloma or, or a soft tissue lesion attached to it. We're going to curette out this socket very thoroughly. Um, I do everything under magnification and headlight so I can see exactly what's, what's down there. Make sure that we clean out the socket very thoroughly. Um, you can start to appreciate that they're right under here or right there, there's a fistula uh, with a soft tissue and a bony defect that we're going to uh, deal with. We've cleaned out the socket real well. We've irrigated it. It's been thoroughly debrided. Place our surgical guide, place our throat pack, and now through the uh, our master sleeve with our drill guides, we're now going to, with very light pressure and lots of irrigation, uh, prep our initial pilot drill, our 2-0 twist. We then immediately go to our next drill. We don't have to stop and take radiographs to make sure that our, our drill is properly placed because we've done all the planning work ahead of time. So it's basically really boom, boom, boom. First drill, second drill, third drill, and now our final drill, through our final drill guide, uh, we're placing uh, are doing our, our final osteotomy. In this case, it's gonna be, it's a 3.7 millimeter diameter uh, osteotomy for a uh, four millimeter implant. And then the implant itself goes through the surgical guide and on the surgical guide or attached uh, to the implant is this guided mount that also goes through the surgical guide. And that guided mount controls the position, the angulation, and also the depth of placement of that implant. So we know that the implant goes just to the right spot 
Uh, generally, I will stop about a half a millimeter short of being fully seated and complete the, seat, the seating and adjust the, um, uh, the timing of the implant with a hand torque wrench. We're now going to take off the implant mount. We take out our surgical guide, which uh, now we can see our implant here, which is in good solid bone. I'm going to place a uh, cover screw over the, uh, over the uh, top of the implant temporarily. Um, you can see here the defect, which we are going to now fill in uh, with some collagen tape. It's going to be double, uh, doubled over and essentially stuffed into that defect between uh, the periosteum, which I've elevated off of the bone, and uh, the buccal alveolar bone. And then we're going to pack some uh, freeze-dried uh, mineralized bone into uh, the area. We're going to basically uh, fill in the defect on the facial. Uh, we're going to trim our surgical or trim our uh, our collagen tape here uh, so that it doesn't overhang. Uh, we're going to finish compacting our graft uh, and then clean it up a little bit and then take off our cover screw and now we're ready to place our immediate prosthesis which has been prepared in the lab off of the master model. And what you'll see is this prosthesis goes into place uh, basically with no adjustment. It goes right into place. We've got the proper timing of the implant, the proper depth of the implant. So this provisional restoration goes right in and basically then we just tighten down the, uh, put in the, the, the uh, abutment screw, tighten it down to 20 newton centimeters. So we do it by hand first and then uh, with the, uh, the torque driver handpiece. Um, and as you can see that this uh, tooth is a little short, we're going to take it a little bit more out of occlusion because we don't want this tooth to have any occlusion on it at all. Um, very light interproximal contact. And uh, postoperatively, uh, you can see that again, we have very accurate implant placement. This implant is perfectly placed. You can actually even see here uh, where we grafted the bone on the buccal defect. And, um, you know, to do this type of immediate implant placement in the anterior, you know, even with experience sometimes can be very difficult. That, that drill can skip off of the bone and become misdirected, and the implant may not end up where we want it to be. But in this case, we have perfect implant placement. This is our uh, follow-up post-op at two weeks. You can see that uh, our collagen membrane kind of poking through, that it's starting to break down. At uh, about four weeks, uh, the collagen membrane has broken down further. It's starting to epithelialize over. And then this is the patient's final restoration, about four months post-placement. And you can see that the soft tissue defect has filled in completely. We have good uh, mucosal contours, good mucosal health, great aesthetics. Um, the uh, lab even made this patient's permanent tooth uh, up on tooth number eight look like uh, you know, same staining as the rest of his teeth. So the patient was extremely happy uh, with this result. It's now been a couple of years since this case, and we've got good maintenance of bone levels, and the patient's doing a good job with hygiene and uh, uh, no problems at all. So, you know, one thing that I get asked all the time is do you really need guided surgery? Do you need all this technology for simple implant cases? And my, my question to you is, what, how do you define a simple case? What is a simple case? In my mind, there is no simple case because even if you take the straightforward case where you've got, you know, let's say tooth number 30 and you've got a nice wide ridge, you've got healthy tooth in front, healthy tooth behind, your placement with that implant has to be absolutely spot on perfect. Okay. Can't be too far mesial, can't be too far distal, can't be buccal, can't be lingual. It's got to be absolutely perfect. If you're doing multiple units, you actually have a little bit more leeway. And if you're doing a fully edentulous case, even more. So I think there's no such thing as a simple case. And I think for these so-called simple cases, guided surgery is even more essential than it is for uh, some of the bigger cases. Um, you know, this is sort of the typical uh, case that we do. A 62-year-old gentleman uh, with uh, some medical issues, diabetes, hypertension, tooth number 30, uh, has a fracture. You can see the furcal radiolucency. He had a previous endo that was failing. You can see the uh, big pocket on the distal that goes all the way down to where the post ends, basically. So we took this tooth out and I grafted it with some Mineros and Cytoplast, waited four months, 
and uh, this is uh, with Mineros freeze-dried mineralized bone and at four months uh, now we're going to do our implant planning we've got our uh, CAD CAM uh, image of the patient's quadrant along with the proposed restoration uh, we import that into our cone beam scan and use this for our implant planning and as you can see in this post-op, and I don't generally do post-ops uh, on uh, post-op scans on every patient, just uh, when basically if it's a more uh, little more tricky case, or we want to make sure the implants in in just the right spot, um, you can see that we again have very ideal, perfect implant placement in this patient, and this was a slam dunk restoration for the patient's dentist. Um, we put on a stock abutment at second stage, and the restoration just is absolutely perfect. This patient has no problem cleaning uh, underneath there. It's got good contours. Um, aesthetically, it looks great. Functionally, it looks great. Um, and years later, we still have good, uh, good bone levels. In fact, you can see here, the bone level actually rose a little bit above the, uh, the collar of the implant. Now here's a little more complicated case where 3D imaging and guided surgery uh, really came in handy. Uh, this patient uh, was losing tooth number 15, uh, which was the distal abutment for a bridge. He also had some uh, atrophy of the posterior mandible and wanted some implants there. And you can see here, here's the atrophic posterior mandible on both sides. Here is uh, where we, uh, the dentist section the bridge and we uh, took out the bridge and here's number 15 that needs to be removed. So we're going to do our 3D imaging um, a little bit with a kind of a hybrid of the older and newer techniques. So I, my feeling is for a complicated case like this, um, you can do CAD CAM imaging, but really nothing is better than a traditional old wax up that's done in the lab to make sure that uh, everything is in occlusion and fits together well on the study models and uh, um, that way we can ex plan exactly where these uh, the final prostate prostheses are going to go and um, so then what we do is we take this these models these wax ups and we duplicate them in stone either in uh, in scannable stone or in this case it was plain old regular yellow stone uh, where uh, did some uh, sprayed with some titanium oxide or dioxide uh, to make this more scannable. Uh, we take that scan of the study model with the wax ups and we then import that into our cone beam and we're going to use this now for planning where these three maxillary implants and the implants on the mandible are going to go and as you can see in the maxilla the ridge is a little narrow here so we're going to be planning for a little bit of uh, ridge expansion at the time of implant placement and on the lower uh, we're going to do three implants on the right, three implants on the left, and um, on the uh, lower right side, we're going to need to just augment a little bit of bone on the buckle at the time the implants are placed, and uh, actually do the same on, on the left side too. So our plan in this patient is to extract tooth number 15 and then do a left maxillary ridge split uh, to widen the ridge and place implants at 12, 13, and 14, and then place the implants in the mandible, um, three on the right, three on the left, and do some freeze-dried bone grafting uh, on the facial uh, in a, a few of the sites. This is the patient's immediate post-op panoramic, and uh, uh, on, this, on the pano, it looks like this is a little close. Clinically, it actually wasn't that close. Um, you can see that he had some implants done in the past. So we've got our three implants on the upper left, three implants on the lower left, and three implants on the lower right. Um, we allow those to uh, integrate for four months. And this is the patient's post-restoration, uh, uh, post-final restoration panoramic and his clinical photograph. And you can see here, um, this doesn't look so great, but of course these are the implants that were placed many years ago. These are the implants that were placed uh, just four months before here, here, and up here on the upper left. And this patient, as you can imagine, is uh, was just ecstatic about this, and even more ecstatic was the patient's dentist, who said this was probably one of the easiest implant cases he, he's ever done. And uh, we've done, I can't tell you how many more uh, we've done since then. Well, you know, if you're like most surgeons, um, you know, you are thinking the thing that 
you know, a lot of a lot of surgeons think. And that is, you know, I've been doing implants for over 20 years or over 10 years or over 15 years, whatever it may be. And, you know, I'm pretty good at it. Why do I need to learn a new way of doing implant surgery? And, you know, my first part of the answer is that time goes on, progress. Technology improves. Are you still taking out impactions with a mallet and chisel or do you use a high speed handpiece? Are you using a paper scheduler and ledger in your office or are you all computerized? Are you using straight pentothal for anesthesia? No, you're using a balanced technique with propofol and would you even think of doing sedation or general anesthetic without a pulse oximeter anymore? No, these are all changes in the way uh, techniques that we were used, protocols that were used since a lot of us trained that have made treatment safer, more efficient, more successful. You know, are you still using one of these? Okay, this is the cell phone or the type of cell phone that I first had when I got my first cell phone. I don't think any of us are using one of those anymore. We all have our iPhones and our smartphones. Technology improves. Okay? We have to improve our treatment of our patients as technology improves because this technology allows us to treat our patients better. There are a number of guided implant surgery systems on the market. and um, uh, So whatever implant system that you're used to using, um, there is probably a fully guided or a partially guided kit that goes along with that uh, surgical system. Now, um, I was um, uh, involved in the development of the BioHorizons guided implant kit, which is uh, was released on the market uh, earlier this year. And I did that with the experience of having used many of the other implant systems out there, and other guided implant systems out there, and keeping a mental note of what I liked and what I didn't like. And I used that information to, um, to design this surgical kit and to advise as far as what components should be in there and uh, um, the clinical protocol. And we introduced this new surgical kit at the BioHorizons Global Symposium in uh, Miami earlier this year. Uh, with uh, quite a bit of fanfare, and this was the, uh, this is the surgical kit that we developed, and uh, we really think it's a nice surgical kit. Uh, I think it's really uh, one of the better kits out there now, not just because uh, I designed it, but because of the fact that I used my knowledge uh, and experience with other kits to help design this. We tried to make the surgical kit and the instrumentation be as simple as possible. Uh, it was designed to be used with the BioHorizons tapered internal uh, and tapered internal plus family of implants. And what's nice is that the implants are all color coded from osteotomy all through implant placement. So the narrow diameter, the three O's are gray, 3.8's are yellow, 4.6's are green, and the 5.8 is blue. And so not only are the implants color coded, but so are all the instruments. So our master cylinders are color coded appropriately, our drill guides, our drivers. And we have, uh, because with the tapered plus, um, we have, a it's, it's platform switched. We have a driver that's different than the tapered internal uh, driver uh, because it basically the implant's got it, you, the implant itself has a smaller platform. Um, this is the complete surgical kit, all the components, and so we have all of the drills, we have all of the drill guides. Uh, one thing that's nice is this quick, uh, quick connect where our, uh, we have two of these uh, quick connect handles in the kit, and my surgical uh, staff, the assistants, place the drill guides into both ends of the quick, uh, into the quick connect handle, and it gives us good um, uh, control over the, uh, over the drill guides and at the same time reduces the number of components that are in the kit. We also have tissue punches that are designed to go through the surgical guides for the drill sleeves. Um, our implant drivers, uh, the typical uh, ratchet uh, hand wrench and then if you're doing a fully edentulous case or a case with some large edentulous spaces where you're using 
uh, fixation pins, scalable fixation pins, those are actually, uh, three of them are included in the kit. And then the other thing here is this depth stop handle, and I'm gonna, I'll show you uh, how that is used. So here is our protocol. Uh, we've got uh, basically for the 3.0 implant system, um, we just have two drills for the 4.6, you're using five, and for the 5.8 diameter, uh, that goes up to seven drills used all together, although um, we're, we're tending to skip a couple of the drills in the middle of the office, and it's working out quite, quite well. You can see on the implant driver, we've got a, a number of uh, position slots here on the driver, and uh, um, that is where the depth handle uh, comes in handy, a uh, depth stop, which I'll show you. So this is a tapered internal platform, 4.6 millimeter implant. This is the green uh, guide sleeve that's used because it's a, um, it's a 4.6 millimeter implant uh, with a uh, platform shift. And we start off with our 2.0 twist drill being placed into uh, the master sleeve on the surgical guide. And then the 2.0 twist drill is used and we do all our drilling with light pressure and copious irrigation. Um, then we go to the 2.5 twist drill, then the 3.2 twist drill, the 3.7, and then the 4.1. Then for placing the implants, we use our drivers, and they're all, of course, color coded to the appropriate um, to the appropriate implant diameter and platform. So um, what we did on this implant driver is it's, it's got four different depth positions. So you can see here one, two two below and two above this black line. And when you do your uh, prepare, or when you plan your surgery, you get an implant report that will tell you uh, what drills need to be used uh, for each osteotomy, as well as which stop position is used for each site. So here, this is at the second uh, stop position. We have not only the uh, stop handle, which can be placed into, um, uh, into the, these grooves or a disposable uh, depth stop, which a lot of people like because it frees up one of your hands. Uh, here is the depth uh, stop in use. You can see how it will stop you, stop the, the, uh, the drill guy or the uh, implant mount, uh, implant driver at the appropriate depth and place the implant at just, just the right depth. Um, so here's a case uh, where we're using the system. Uh, this patient is a uh, now 22-year-old uh, 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 female who came in to see me. Um, she initially saw me get her wisdom teeth out, but also was having some issues with tooth number 10, which was failing. So you can see there's uh, the tooth is at a root canal, there's a periapical radiolucency, um, and this tooth basically uh, was diagnosed with a fracture after her wisdom teeth were out, and we plan uh, to remove this tooth and place an immediate implant. So of course we're going to use the planning software to see if this is gonna be feasible. So here you can see um, that we've got lots of uh, good healthy bone in order to anchor this implant. Uh, you can see in the different uh, cross sections, we've got good solid bone, buccally and lingually, at least two millimeters on the buccal, two millimeters on the lingual or palatal. We've got enough space interproximally, and we can line this up, the long axis of the implant, very nicely with the provisional uh, or with the final prosthesis. So this is that drilling protocol report that I was talking about, and what it tells us is that the implant we're gonna place is a, um, it's a, um, uh, 4.6, I'm sorry, it's a 3.5, um, uh, 3.8 millimeter diameter, diameter implant uh, that's uh, 15 millimeters in length. And what we're going to be drilling is we're gonna be using, through the drill guides, we're gonna use the, the yellow drill guides and we're gonna drill a 2.0, 2.8, and 3.2, 3.2 using the 28 millimeter long drill. And so the drills are of various lengths and it's the combination of the position of that guide sleeve with the length of the drill that determines the, the depth to which the osteotomies are placed and uh, to which the implant is placed. So here again is our master sleeve in our surgical guide. We're going to use our 2-0 twist through the yellow uh, drill guide 
And again, we're going to do this with copious irrigation and short strokes uh, with lots of irrigation. Then the 2.5 millimeter uh, guide and twist drill, followed then by the 3.2. And then the implant's going to be placed at stop position 4. And uh, actually, uh, that would be right here uh, in, on, the, on the drill guide. Uh, in this illustration, this is where it's stop position uh, 2. But in this patient, we're going to be using stop position 4. And uh, let's take a look at the surgery. And this is uh, basically in real time. So we're going to place our surgical guide. And this was a, a milled surgical guide, uh, completely uh, digitally made um, from all the digital data. Uh, we're going to place our throat pack. And we're going to use a tissue punch. In this case, the patient has lots of keratinized tissue. And so we uh, have determined that we are able to um, use a tissue punch. Uh, so after we've used the tissue punch, we're going to use our little straight curette in order to remove that tissue plug that we've cut. So that comes out uh, fairly easily. Sometimes we do have to remove the surgical guide in order to get it out. Um, but now that we've got it out, we're going to do our initial osteotomy. We're going to place our uh, 2.0 twist drill guide, and you can see it's in that uh, quick connect handle. Uh, and we've got our 2.0 drill in place. Once it's in the guide, we're going to start the motor and with light strokes, uh, in and out pumping motion, so we are sure to get the bone fragments out and irrigation in, uh, we've completed the first osteotomy. Then we're going to slow down the drill and we're going to do our second twist drill, which is the 2.5. We've got our drill guide in place. And uh, uh, again, with copious irrigation and short light strokes, we're going to slowly advance the, uh, the drill to the uh, apex all the way down to the bottom of the osteotomy. And again, uh, we're going to irrigate it, get out any bone fragments, uh, and then go to our third and final osteotomy, uh, which is using the 3.2 millimeter twist drill. And again, we're going to slow down the, uh, the motor uh, to about, uh, about 200 RPM for this. And again, with light strokes, lots of irrigation, we're going to go all the way to the stop on the drill. So it's a 28 millimeter drill. And the stop on the master sleeve, uh, master cylinder, determines uh, how far that drill is going to go. We can see our osteotomies. Uh, we're going to, in this case, we take the surgical guide out to thoroughly irrigate. Surgical guide goes back in now, and then we're going to place our implant. Now, this patient uh, was going off to college, and uh, we had talked about doing immediate provisional for her um, and uh, discussed the fact that that provisional would be a party tooth. She didn't think that uh, she was going to be able to maintain a soft diet. Um, and so uh, in this case, we're just going to place the implant, place a cover screw, and um, uh, then um, uh, she's going to be having an Essex bridge as a provisional restoration. So the uh, surgical guide comes out. We can look at our implant in place. We see that it's perfectly positioned at the ideal depth. We're going to now adjust the final timing with our torque wrench and final depth of placement so that we're about two to three millimeters uh, subgingival right at the, at the uh, bony crest. Take our implant driver out. We're checking uh, with a perio probe. We're just at about three millimeters there. Uh, lots of irrigation. Make sure there's no bony or soft tissue debris. And then we're placing a healing abutment uh, that we're going to tighten down to uh, about 20 Newton centimeters. So that's going to be placed. Uh, in this case, we didn't have to do any bone grafting when we took the tooth out, uh, and the case is essentially done. And uh, now we're going to put in her Essex bridge, which she's going to wear for uh, the treatment period. And you can see that uh, gives her a nice aesthetic uh, provisional restoration. And uh, this is our, our post-op image, which again shows a very good really perfect implant placement um, and uh, perfect spacing. And at her three and a half month post-op check, we can see we've got nice soft tissue contours, our healing abutment. Remember, this is about a three millimeter healing abutment. So our 
implant margin is basically three millimeters subgingival. We've got papillas that are, are developing uh, in the site and uh, she is now off to college and back east and she's having the rest uh, restorative work done back in uh, New York City and so I'm hoping to get her final uh, images uh, back soon. So, you know, I've been talking about guided implant surgery and guided implant uh, surgical kits and you know, the question again comes up, do I really need this, okay? And I liken guided implant surgery and 3D imaging to GPS. I call it, it's like GPS for placing implants, okay? You know, I can get from my house to the office and I can get from my house to the airport without GPS. I don't really need it. And so, you know, you may think, well, you can place a simple straightforward implant or multiple implants without this technology. But I'll tell you that my idea of this technology changed when I got my new car that had GPS with real-time traffic. And what I've found is that I can plug in where I'm going and it will tell me what the traffic is like on the way to where I'm going. And so if I need to get off and take another route to get to the office or the airport more efficiently and not get stuck in that, it does that for me. The GPS with, with real-time traffic is like guided implant surgery. I can get along just fine without it, okay? But I can get to where I'm going with greater accuracy, greater efficiency, and less stress using this technology. So I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, if you uh, have any questions, feel free to e email me. My email address is right here. Um, and I thank you for your time and again for your attention. And uh, I'll be uh, signing off from beautiful Southern California. Thanks.